Welcome back, everybody. This is Trek Yards, and I am, of course, Captain Foley. And I'm Kamala Cockings. So, Captain, what are you up to at the moment? Well, I'm just sitting here in my office, orbiting. Right. Um, may I inquire as to what you're orbiting? Well, the sun, of course. And I'm sure that you are as well. At least I would assume so. I'd hope so. <laughs> Wait, did, did you think I meant orbiting the planet? That would just be silly. Because this is clearly not a facility. It's an awful script, Stuart. Um, and there you have it, guys. The captain's of interesting brand of humor ushered in yet another Trek Yards episode for you all. And as you've all seen from the thumbnail and the title of this episode, we are taking a look at the orbital office facility from Star Trek Motion Picture today. Yes, indeed we are. And after hitting you guys up with some facts and information on this station, hey, that rhymes. <laughs> Anyways, after giving you all the stats, we will be pleased to bring in the designer of this complex to discuss it and see just how the design develops. That is right. We'll have the one and only Andrew Probert joining us after our information section to, for the designing portion of the show. So we hope you're really looking forward to that part and hear all of his amazing dry humor and just pure knowledge. This is a little scene and rarely taught about a piece of Star Trek history, so learning some new things should provide a most interesting episode. Uh, now this office facility complex really hasn't been given any specific name, although in the novelization of the motion picture, the office complex was also referred to as the Centroplex, which mm. actually sounds like a character name from Transformers, to be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, we do know that this station was approximately 210 meters wide and 200 meters in height. These measurements were estimated based on the size of the round docking hatches, mm. which are clearly visible on the model. So obviously a very small station. Although it's never stated in canon anyways, what the exact purpose of this complex serves. It seems very likely this houses at least part of the, uh, the administration facility for the fleet yards and orbital construction facilities. The Enterprise received its her refit in 2271. It is worth saying that technically, no other stations of this type were ever shown again, unless of course you count the upside down versions such as Regular One and Starbase 375, which, you know, they have pieces missing here and there, but this is this version is rather unique in the world of mm. Star Trek. Yes, the station was part of Starfleet's San Francisco Yards facility, and was likely located in a geosynchronous orbit above San Francisco itself. And while James D. Cook beamed to the orbital office complex before being shuttled via travel pod to the refurbished Enterprise was an orbital dry dock in 2271. Interesting fact, this was the first time that Admiral Kirk had in fact seen the Enterprise in two and a half years since returning from his five-year mission and his new Admiralty had kept him quite busy with administration and desk duties. What by Kirk like was that? Poor bastard. <laughs> The office complex is composed of four long brownish or copper tubes occupying the upper two-thirds of the station. <clears throat> These were the deuterium tanks, which stored fuel for the station's main fusion batteries. This is a distributed power system, so there is no main reactor. The inner tanks are protected from cosmic radiation by additional shielding. Openings in the hull allowed for the refueling as well as for structural inspection. A set of clamps were used to hold the tanks in place, and located in the center and running the entire length of the structure was a Jeffrey's tube. At the very top of this assembly is a maintenance pod, topped with a short-range subspace antenna assembly. The upper pod is reachable by either transporter or by the aforementioned Jeffrey's tube. The Jeffrey's tube is in fact actually a zero-G tube, so there's no danger of falling, and the tube also alternates from side to side to prevent injury from building up too much momentum. Directly below the tanks is the modular tree hub. This main hub featured four docking ports, access to the central hub, and corridors leading to the office modules. The upper atrium of the central core provides access to the Jeffrey's tube, which Samuel was just referring to. The outer section, or promenade, of this structure is essentially a circular arboretum, providing the only recreation facility aboard the station. Benches and seating are provided along the inner wall of the corridor, facing outwards. Plants such as small bushes, trees, flowers, and even some fruits and vegetables lined the outer rim of the module and could be seen from the outside through large windows. This section, with all the plants, also serves as to aid the air recycling and can be adapted into a hydroponics bay. There are four points of access to the station in the form of stairs, as well as turbo lifts. Restrooms are located behind each promenade lift. It's like you're on a flight, Samuel. The restaurants can be located on either side at the rear. <laughs> 
Uh, the station was obviously of a modular design and included offices, storage, and some rec recreational facilities. These discs were easily interchangeable and could be reconfigured quite easily as the situation called for. Think of it as a giant size space Lego set. Each of these separate office discs are clearly just one deck tall, as evidenced by the window sizes as well as the shots of the travel pod on docking. Mm -hmm. So of course, as mentioned above, knowing this size uh, makes estimating the total station fairly simple at around 200 meters across at the widest point. Aside from the lower service module and central core, this meant that over time the station could adapt and grow to meet new demands, mm -hmm. and in fact you can even see one of these modules under construction. Which I thought was a nice touch when I saw it in the movie and having mm -hmm. looked it after the fact. Different styles of pods or modules included offices, accommodations, briefing or conference rooms, docking and transporter modules, communications, security, engineering workshops, labs, and cargo facilities. Pretty much everything, and they all had a kitchen sink. <laughs> uh, the personnel module served as quarters for eight people, with each person having their own room. There's also a small mess hall with replicators, and the central room of these pods holds life support equipment, as well as damage control and emergency supplies. The central core connects the modular tree hub and deuterium tanks to the service module below. Its five levels are filled with turbo lift shafts and Jeffrey's tubes, mm. and a ring of 32 escape pods. Normally shafts have cars available at every stop, but here they are absent for two reasons. Firstly, to facilitate evacuation to the escape pods should the need arise, and secondly because there is not enough room in this section for turbo lift cars to pass each other. Interesting. The escape... so you, have to wait for your, you have to wait for your lift in this one. Yeah. What's, what's a minute in the grand scheme of things? The escape pods are single occupant pods capable of reaching a safe distance. However, they cannot land on a planetary surface and must remain in orbit until rescued, but luckily right next to Earth, so it's fine. Although, unless the Enterprise is the only ship in the quadrant, in which case they stay quite a while in orbit. <laughs> once, the, once the occupant is secured in the escape pod, the outer hatch is blown away and the life pod is ejected at a very high velocity. The lower section of the station houses cargo and docking facilities, and a number of small shuttles can be docked there at any given time. The station has a small contingent of travel pods, as well as work bees for aiding in the repair and construction of ships at the nearby dry dock. The lower section also contains some factories and workshop areas that fabricated smaller parts for final ship assembly or repair. As mentioned earlier, the office complex is a final transport and cargo hub, or way station if you prefer, for the reefer enterprise which was nearing launch. It has been speculated that Earth's space dock, as seen in Star Trek III, was actually in full operation at this time, and that the majority of the Enterprise major refit assemblies took place there, and then the ship was moved to the more exposed external dry dock facility for final testing and ca calibration of ship systems, minor final assemblies, and of course the final interior and external ex inspections. So naturally this is where Scotty and Kirk depart from to perform their inspection tour of the ship, and this is also where Commander Sonak and Vice Admiral Lori Sayana are killed in a transporter accident. Interesting side note, Kirk and Lori Sayana, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, were actually involved at one point. That makes that seem even more heartbreaking. Oh no. It does. And now for some behind the scenes details before being Andrew on. The set for the office complex's interior, including the travel pod set, was constructed on Paramount's Stage 17 and cost 60,000 US dollars. The exterior model facility was filmed in the summer of 1978, one of Douglas Trumbull's stages at Future General Corporation. And of course, following the motion picture, the model of the complex was turned upside down, and modified for regular one base for Star Trek 2 and for other stations including the Fleet Command Center in Deep Space Nine. Okay, now it's time to bring in Andrew Probert to discuss this awesome design. Welcome back to the show, Andrew. As always, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Great being here again. All right, so let's get into the first question. Uh, was this one of the first things that you were asked to do for the movie? Uh, can you tell us a little about those first days working on the motion picture and exactly what the script called for in regards to this station? Um, yes, no, sometimes, and usually. Okay, okay. so in Star Trek previously... <laughs> Uh, yeah, the um, I'm trying to remember. It seems like the space office complex was probably the first thing I was asked to design specifically, um, and then that of course went into the dry dock. But um, that was the first thing that I think I was asked to design. And Gene, I don't think he had any specific requirements for that. Um, 
an earlier version for Phase 2 had been designed that looked like some kind of a dodectrahedron oddball shape with little components placed at the at the end of these rods. It's, I'm sure you'll have a picture of that, but it seemed like a very odd design for a space station. Mm. So I, I started from scratch, basically. And uh, Gene did have an idea that he wanted, and this was even from those days, he wanted the travel pod to look like one of those office units. And for, for no other reason that, that he thought it would be a fun surprise to watch this office sort of break away mm -hmm. from the main complex and be used as a transporting vehicle. Mm. So, um, so if you see earlier versions of their travel pod, it looked like one of these odd shapes. So when I finally came up with my kind of a pie-shaped modular components, then um, that was my original take on uh, on the travel pod. So in, in Star Trek previously, we'd only ever seen the K-7 space station. This was not a Starfleet-run base. Given the lack of cannon to look at, where did you pull inspiration from? And talk us through the basic shape design for this. Um, and like, so where did you get any inspiration from for this design? Well, originally I started with just a collection of these kind of pie-shaped items. And then I was trying to logically cluster them together. Yeah. Um, so, some of the early components, I'm looking at my, looking at my research here, my back reference. The one thing I wanted to have was uh, kind of a factory as part of the complex. Mm. Then there would be living quarters and offices. And I was I wanted to have some very tall units mm. that I was making into uh, hydroponic tanks for growing food uh, for the station, as well as helping to recirculate the air, the oxygen on the station. Mm. Uh, and then there was a power core at the bottom uh, in, in all of my early designs. Hmm. Um, these designs proportionately kept kept changing as I was going through different iterations. Hmm. And uh, I finally came up with the idea, I mean, sometimes the factory was ginormous and sometimes hmm. it was smaller. Um, but uh, there's this color version which you can see the travel pot actually leaving, this painting that I did. Uh, and I was getting closer to that uh, mm. idea with the with the hydroponic tanks above the living quarters and offices, and then on the very top of that was dockyard control, which controlled mm. the complex and all of the dry docks. In all of my drawings, there had been like five dry docks attached to this one complex. Mm. In the movie, of course, they only see one, mm. but. Um, in my mind, there's more than one dry dock, just like there would be in a regular shipyard. Mm. Uh, so if, if this color picture is so radically different in terms of that huge under section to the more familiar top bit, then how did you convert that all the way into what we, we saw then? Why change the shape so dramatically and, and make it more of a, a hangar, I suppose? Well, it's still, it's still a manufacturing facility, but my mm. thinking was that that the components... Uh, any larger components that were needed could be basically extruded out from the from the factory. It wouldn't all have to be enclosed like mm. a steel. You know, you could actually start building like extruding, like a, what what has evolved into 3D printing, basically. Mm. But mm. back in those days, I was just envisioning something, constructing something as it was working, and mm. and building it. You know, it, it basically extruding it as it was constructing. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I. I envision mostly smaller components that, that need to, to be re-manufactured. It's, 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 you know, it's not meant to build an entire starship. It's meant to mm. repair things that have gone wrong. So mm. when I started thinking about it that way, I thought, well, you wouldn't really need a huge facility for that. Now, in regards to those upper copper tanks, uh, mm. You had just mentioned that you initially thought they were hydroponics bays or botanical tanks to grow fruits and vegetables without soil. Mm -hmm. um, those have since been changed by people into deuterium tanks. <laughs> so my question is, 
when you design when you were designing this in your head did you have everything worked out as how everything worked which i would assume you did because you're you and that's how you do things um but just talk us through those tanks specifically and how you saw those working quite well actually um okay. always good <laughs> basically um on the inside of those i would just see long long corridors with vegetables in a circular circular pattern that would you know grow stuff um i mean i well you're i'm designing for a, for a movie not a not an encyclopedia but but my initial thinking is that there would be a lot of vegetation in there uh it could be used by the space station it could be used in resupplying uh, starships but its main purpose was to re, re Reflush the oxygen, create oxygen. Mm. Mm. So um, that's how I saw those. And then uh, just below those, there's a ring, which is a mm. which is basically a, a recreational ring, yeah. which would be which would be like a lounge, basically a very large lounge with windows all around. And there would be walking trails, or jogging, kind of a jogging track. There would be mm. places to sit. Uh, you could have a meal. You know, there'd be all kinds of ways that you could just have uh, your off, spend your off time up in that ring. Mm -hmm. And um, I have one compound image that I've sent you that shows basically that there's like escalators or yeah escalators that go down into a central lobby. Mm -hmm. And there's there are, um, from from that central lobby, then you could go out to the office. Uh, wings or to the domestic wings mm -hmm. and those are both double corridors uh, in case there's a breach in one of them then they then it's they can be sealed yeah. off so that you can still get around but you know it doesn't totally disable that arm um, mm -hmm. cool. that's very cool actually that is this week's trek yards done and dusted next week we've got another great part Yes, the continuation. Next week. Tune in. So, seven days and just uh, click on that link. So, we'll see you then. See you then, guys.